So thank you, Phil. Uh, thanks all of you for coming. Appreciate the uh, opportunity. Appreciate the flexibility to have me back. Uh, I got uh, canceled out once before due to some travel constraints. Um, feel free to interrupt, ask questions anywhere uh, and about anything. It doesn't have to be on topic. It can be anything you're interested in. Um, uh, as Phil said, I'm with Birla Carbon. We're a global leader in carbon black. It's a key ingredient that goes into tires, other rubber goods, or plastics, inks, coatings. So primarily for rubber, it gives it its strength characteristics. Um, for non-rubber products, it's mainly for color, uh, UV, conductivity properties, things like that. About 25% of the weight of a tire is carbon black. So it's a very large volume global chemical. Um, Bureau of Carbon is about a two or three billion dollar revenue company. Revenue is not a great measure for the corporation. We generally pass through our raw material, which is a oil-based feedstock, um, so it can vary widely. But it's a large company, 16 manufacturing sites. We operate on uh, five continents, um, 12 countries, and a little under 3,000 employees. We're part of a large Indian conglomerate, the Aditya Birla Group. It's about a $45 billion business. We don't consolidate at the group level, so these are independently owned or controlled companies, but would include leaders like Novellus, which is the world's largest player in rolled aluminum. Um, we're the largest player in viscose fiber. We're the third largest telecom operator uh, when Idea Cellular combined with Vodafone India a few months ago. Um, so we're, it's a very diverse company across a wide range of, of industries. It's the third largest cement producer outside of China. Um, our vision at Birla Carbon is to be the most respected, sustainable, and dynamic player in our industry. I'm going to see if this works, and if it doesn't, we're going to uh, skip it. It seemed to earlier, so we'll see. But it will play into the conversation later, I think. What does it mean to be strong? It's not about how big you are or the weight you can carry. It's about lifting others up. Strength isn't about black or white. It's being comfortable in the gray. It's a place where doors are open and minds never close. It makes it easy to get things done and hard to let each other down. It's stepping up to a challenge and knowing when to step out of the way. <laughs> Strength doesn't come from getting the credit. It comes from giving more than it takes. Not a pat on the back, but having someone else's. Because when strength is real, it lights a fire that burns so bright, it guides us beyond the now to engineer what's next, to form the bonds that build our products. Our people, our customers, and our communities. What does it mean to have true strength? Our strength? It means there's always enough to go around. That's why we will continue to create, redefine, and share the strength. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get this down there or not. Um, 
the film was the culmination of a purpose project we did in Birla Carbon last year, and it really started the prior year, and it was focused on excavation of who we are. We've been in carbon black for 150 years, so we've been doing this a long time. Um, but understanding who we are collectively at our best. Our factories, the newest one was uh, built in China, and we started up in September of the prior year. Our oldest factory is built in western Kansas um, in the mid-40s based on natural gas. We've got plants we've built on our technology, plants that were built on another technology, plants we've built, sold, and rebought. So a wide range of experiences and histories across the company. And what we were looking for, there's some, some ties that bind us, and this concept of collaboration really came out. And so when we talk today about uh, the need for diverse experiences, it really shows through in a company like Birla Carbon, which is a very small company, uh, only 2,600 employees, but we're very dispersed. So our factories are 40 to 150 people. We have a couple that get into that 300 range. We've got 140 people in our headquarters in Marietta. Not a lot of people in any single location. Um, we are very diverse culturally, but how do you work together effectively across that geography and leverage that diversity? But diverse experiences wind up being very important for us to be successful. Um, just a little bit about my history. I, I graduated from UTC in 1992, as Phil mentioned. Um, I was a chemical engineer. My first job right out of college was as a process engineer in a big chemical company, Monsanto. It's not a chemical company today. It, uh, eventually was acquired by Pharmacia Upjohn, acquired by Pfizer. They spun Monsanto off as a, uh, as a biotech company, and the chemical company was spun off previously from Monsanto as Solution. It's now owned by Eastman. But that's pretty common parentage when you think about companies today. <laughs> they go through transition a lot. Um, but at the time I joined, uh, I was a very typical hire. So we hired accountants and we hired chemical engineers, um, and that was all we hired as a chemical company. Um, I changed assignments about every 12 to 24 months. So uh, I went through five different locations, four different businesses. The company was spun off. We went through bankruptcy. Um, I had roles in technology, manufacturing, business management, supply chain, procurement. Um, we moved uh, as a family about every two years. Um, and that was pretty typical at the time for big company employees in the United States. Uh, when I joined the Carbon Black business in 2005, uh, the company was in the process of being sold from Phelps Dodge, which was a large mining company now owned by Freeport McMoran. Um, we eventually went through a combination of a Korean-owned chemical company and, and private equity, uh, bought out by private equity, and then sold to the Aditya Birla Group as a uh, strategic buyer. Um, but the opportunity for Carbon Black was we were a small company with true global scope. Even at the time, the company had 12 manufacturing sites spread out around the world. And it was a chance for me to work on a true global scale. At Monsanto, I spent most of my time in the nylon business and intermediate chemicals. Did a lot of interaction internationally, Japan, Asia, Europe, South America. But we manufactured in North America and exported out. Um, so this was a chance to get a true global scope role. Um, and I did a number of roles within the company. When we joined, we were functionally oriented, so I had responsibility for our global operations, organization, and engineering. Um, went through a few different P&L roles, led our technology organization. I've been uh, leading the company for the last few years. I guess the comment I would make here, which was very different than what I perceived when I sat in this room at your age, is that very few people will spend their career entirely in a technical role. So some of you will start your own company, and what that ultimately means is you'll be doing payroll, accounting, cleaning the bathrooms, everything. Uh, some of you will join a big company, um, and ultimately a diverse set of experiences is what a big company is going to be looking for. Um, I would encourage all of you to take a wide range of broadening opportunities. So whether that's assignments, whether it's projects, volunteering, um, generally risk provide you an opportunity to have a much bigger impact on an organization. I think it's a lot less of an issue today. So our newer employees coming in don't see risk of employment the same way as I did when I joined the workforce. We were looking, we were kind of in that between stage where you were looking for lifetime employment or maybe two or three employers over the course of a career. That's a lot less of a concern to your generation today, I understand that. 
Um, it was challenging for people at that time to take risks. They saw things like bankruptcy as a big risk. They saw private equity as a bad word. It meant change was coming and restructuring was coming. Um, the reality is risk provides opportunity to make outsized contributions. And it's an opportunity to grow. Um, human psychology would, would say that we're all more afraid of protecting what we have than thinking about what we could gain. A lot of people particularly view their careers in that way. Think about the upside as carefully as you think about the downside and take those risks. The worst thing that can happen is not that bad. You're going to gain experience that provides opportunities for you in the future. And ask yourself, how can I have a greater impact? So uh, you're going to take that first job and you're going to think this job description is very clear on what your responsibilities are and what they expect of you. Um, the reality is most of us don't put a lot of thought process into those job descriptions beyond what the minimum expectation is. How much more can you do beyond that is ultimately going to dictate how far you go. Um, when we hire engineers or when we are employees at Bureau of Carbon, there are a few things that we look for. The basics are important. Sound technical foundation and the right export expertise for the right role are critical. You're not going to get in the door unless you have that. Um, whether you're an accountant, whether you're in HR, whether you're in uh, engineering or a physicist in our material science lab. But we're really looking for something and someone with more diverse set of experiences. So even as a college graduate, different work experiences are pretty important for us. So have you had multiple internships? Have you worked at different places? It can be everything from tending bar to an engineering internship. That diversity of interaction provides you a set of skills that you don't fully appreciate when you're going through that. Um, are you passionate uh, about your interests? So the reality is very few college graduates show up at Bureau of Carbon's offices in Marietta and are passionate about carbon black. I would guarantee you there are very few people in the world who are passionate about carbon black. That was really the basis for the film you saw to try to engage the employee organization, see that we're more than makers of carbon black. We're providing a future. Um, you know, carbon black's uh, a, a nanomaterial that's been around for a long, long time. Uh, nano's cool and sexy today. It wasn't when, uh, when we started carbon black. Um, but are you passionate about what your interests are? And ultimately, that'll ensure you're passionate about your work and, and what we do. Um, longer term, I'm looking for willingness to try new things. And can you influence outside of your control? Um, so the reality is most of us can manage within our hierarchy. Uh, and we can influence those people who work for us. Uh, but can you influence people who don't work for you, they work with you? Or can you influence people who don't work with you, they work for a different company? Um, that's the kind of skill that allows people to be successful. And a broader set of experiences provides the platform for you to be more influential. Um, ultimately, that multifunction, multi-site, multi-geography experience helps people understand how to get things done regardless of where they are. When I sit in our offices in Hanover, I don't interact with customers and people in the same way to get the same thing done as I do when I'm in India or Sao Paulo or Marietta. The what doesn't change, the values never change, but you have to be flexible on the how based on what works and what doesn't wherever you are. Um, I would encourage you to think about that even in your day-to-day -day experiences and the different people you work with within this room. You'll be more effective getting things done differently with different individuals and different departments. Diverse perspectives ultimately provide a healthy debate, and that's what makes <coughs> ideas better. A lot of you think of diversity as either gender diversity, cultural diversity, ethnic diversity. It's all those. It's experiential diversity. Um, but companies really appreciate diverse experiences. And the value and capability of navigating a diverse history provides us confidence that you're going to be successful at navigating a diverse future. Just a couple comments on the chemical industry. There have been no questions yet. Please jump in if you have any. Um, demographics are in our favor. So when you think about the growing middle class in the developing world, these are new consumers that are growing at the size of the United States consumption every five years or so. Um, so Tremendous opportunity with the growing middle class 
and consuming class in the developing world. Sustainability is critical. Um, sustainability is not just what ensures our future, but it provides us great business opportunity to profit along the way, quite frankly. And we have to be part of the solution. So the chemical industry doesn't have a great name. Um, when you're in an industry called carbon black, the assumption is you're a polluter. Um, if there's black stuff on somebody's car in a neighborhood where we work, they think it's ours. Chances are it's from the steel factory down the street or somewhere else. But you've got to be better than everybody else. Um, sustainability provides great business opportunities. So when you think of things like uh, electric vehicles, there's a gentleman from Volkswagen talked about electric vehicles earlier today in a luncheon. And, um, you know, the, the reality is that it's going to take a whole new set of materials to be successful in that field. And chemical engineering and chemical companies are the ones that are going to develop those materials that allow that success. Um, so when you think about mobility, markets are going to value new solutions. They're going to see things differently. Fleet management will look at the effectiveness and efficiency of an automobile very differently than you and I do. So I get in my car in the morning, drive it to work. I put 10, 20,000 miles a year on this car. It always works when I need to, great. How fuel efficient are the tires? I don't care that much, quite frankly. How, how long do they last? I look at it when I buy them, but really not that big a deal. If you're a fleet operator, you look at those components very differently. You look at how the seat wears very differently when it's being used 18 or 19 hours a day versus 18 or 19 minutes a day. So they're going to be able to measure performance very differently and they will value performance very differently. And what provides performance are the materials that ultimately go in to those automobiles. So whether it's the fabric on the seat or the 2% of carbon black that goes in to the material makeup of an electric lithium ion battery, that's what provides the performance of that battery. Companies are going to seek new versus what's worked in the past. So we know what we know. When we bring in a new employee, we're looking for somebody to help us become who we want to become, not to assimilate them into who we are. If we wanted to stay who we were, we wouldn't need new employees. <laughs> um, collaborative innovation is going to be the way. So generally, companies, particularly when I started, had large research and development organizations. We did all our R&D in-house. Um, you can't do that today. We're not experts on enough different things to successfully package this suite of materials together to be successful in that battery application. We have to work across industry, suppliers and customers, and with academia to find these solutions. Things like IP, which are important to UTC becoming a research institution, something we talked about, <laughs> about a few minutes ago. Um, how do you find a way to protect IP and gain value out of it, but be flexible enough with it such that you're sharing and building on it? That collaborative spirit is ultimately what will create the most value. And we've got to find a way to do both. It's not either or, it's, it's both and. Um, digital is going to drive speed. So digital is really not that uh, convoluted or complicated a concept. It's a better way of understanding all the data and information that's available to us and making it uh, available in a way that we can make decisions and act on it quickly. Um, so things will continue to happen much faster than they ever have in, a, in the past. If you've ever sat in a presentation with a futurist and you'll hear them describe you know, this kind of bimodal potential, we'll either wind up in chaos after AI and the machines kill us, or we're going to look like Star Trek. It sounds crazy, but their forecast of the future is a lot closer to what we're going to see 10 years down the road than what we see today. So they're more right than we are in most cases, we being old people like me, not young people like you. Um, the opportunity to shape the future has never been greater than it is right now for engineers, technologists, chemical companies. Um, our customers are hungrier than they've ever been to help them understand where to create value. They're more willing to try something different than they've ever been before. Uh, our largest customer base are the tire companies. Um, tire companies are notoriously slow to move. I mean, fundamentally, that's the part touching the road of an automobile, and there's a lot of liability associated if something goes wrong. So they're very scared to change. 
But the biggest tire companies of today won't be the biggest tire companies of tomorrow, and those companies are willing to take risks to catch up in performance and capability to, to the names you all recognize domestically today. And those new materials are going to allow them to do something very different, and ultimately it's taking that risk and finding a way to manage it to be effective. So in terms of prepared remarks, that's all I've got um, and a range of topics, but happy to, to talk about anything on your mind or anything not on your mind. Especially with tires. I know it's really hard to recycle tires, like for example. So. Yep. Um, so Bureau of Carbon issued its sixth sustainability report last year. So we've been doing this annually for six years and, and issue a sustainability report. I encourage all of you to go out to BureauofCarbon.com. You can find the video I showed. You can find our sustainability report. Um, you can find that very old picture of me that was uh, up on the wall up here where I looked a lot younger than I do today. Um, so sustainability is really core for us. There are a couple aspects of it that make it very, very important. Um, carbon black is produced from a heavy residual oil. It can either come off the refining train or it can come off of coking coal or it can come off cracking oil products to make uh, um, ethane and propane. But regardless, it's a heavy residual oil and about half of it turns into carbon black in our reactor, a little more than. The rest of that carbon is gas. It's a heat source. We use it to generate energy. We have cogeneration, things like that, and ultimately it's vented. So while some of the world views us as carbon emitters, we view ourselves as carbon sequesterers. We capture half the carbon of this oil that would otherwise be going to the atmosphere, and we're putting it into a usable molecular product. But the more we can put in that product, the more sustainable the earth and the more money we make, because we don't sell that gas, we sell that carbon black. Um, so sustainability from that perspective, very important. Our downstream, and, and our, we've done a carbon footprint um, over the lifetime from extracting our raw materials out of the ground to delivering our product to customers. We're looking to work with our customers now to understand how that affects it. Um, tires are a big issue. So uh, there are a lot of tires in the world. The majority of tires are managed um, and reclaimed for tire-derived fuel, so they're used predominantly in cement kilns. You can find them other places. Um, they'll grind them up and they'll put them on playground fields, uh, things of that nature. And there are uh, pyrolysis processes around where you can deconstruct a tire. You know, you rip the metal out, re recycle it, deconstruct the tire, and you take it back to a carbon product and oil. Um, these are things that we're looking at on how can we impart and utilize those materials with carbon black. They aren't really carbon black. They don't have the same properties as carbon black chemically to operate in a, a rubber matrix in the same way, but they have properties that are useful. It's a different product. And so we're looking at how can we can utilize those materials with carbon black um, to go into some of the end uses that we sell into today or some new end uses potentially. But again, it's from a perspective of uh, our commitment to the long-term health of this organization. We, we've been here for 100 years, so we want to be here 100 years from now. And it's also what we view as a way to help us drive profitability differently. Our customers see sustainability as a security, a supply issue. Are you going to be here in 10, 20, 50 years? Um, they don't make carbon black, and you don't make tires without it. <laughs> so they, they see it as pretty important, and that's, that's why we see sustainability uh, as important. We've got a lot of R&D going on a lot of areas in, in order to allow us to be more profitable value creators in a world that's focused on sustainability and values it differently. It is a difficult challenge though, so you think of things like air emissions. A lot of the ways you control air emissions is you run water through scrubbers to take stuff out. It's great. And we operate a plant in southern Louisiana, lots of water, great solution. There are parts of India we operate where there's only lots of water two months out of the year. It's not a great solution. So we can fix one problem, but you create another one in terms of water scarcity. So it's not ever going to be a right answer for everywhere. Um, it's going to be a multitude of answers uh, that allow us to ultimately solve these problems effectively based on the situational demands. The hardest lesson I had to learn over the course of my career. Um, this won't be very um, 
profound in terms of, of your future uh, employment, I would suspect. But ultimately, it's finding that balance. If it doesn't work for you personally, even if it's a great professional opportunity, it's not going to work. If it doesn't work for your family, it's not going to work. It's got to work for the employer, it's got to work for the individual, it's got to work for the family. So for instance, I talk about diverse experiences. I've made moves that didn't work out well for my wife and children, and I paid the price for that. <laughs> um, I've relocated employees halfway around the world, only to turn around and have to either bring them back or watch them leave the company because it didn't work for their family. That kind of experience is invaluable in terms of your future opportunity, but if it doesn't fit with your personal needs at the same time, it's not going to work. You've you got to ensure that you maintain that balance and are, and are very comfortable that all three of those facets are effective. The, the company benefits, the individual benefits, and the individual's family benefits. And if you think you can overcome one of those, either through a salary number or a new car or I can travel back and forth, um, think hard on it before you make that decision. In the same subject, how do you uh, grade the soft skills or people skills or that kind of skill in, in what you do and how it can be incorporated to the education system, like in engineering, for example? Well, um, I think rating them is challenging for an employer. From an employer's perspective, it, the interview is the interaction opportunity. Um, and the resume describes the experiences. If somebody has successfully navigated three or four very different types of experiences, that gives you a lot more confidence. So that's one thing we look at when measure. Um, we try to get a broad-based interview type interaction so everybody provides their perspectives, a diverse group of people. Um, and, and we do rely on um, word of mouth kind of interactions and references. So a faculty member at UTC who knows student X and has an opinion. I know Dr. Heestan, I know what he thinks, I know what he likes and maybe what he doesn't. We don't know each other that well. It's been a long time since uh, we've interacted. But that, that interaction is still very important. So in a world where resumes go out electronically, um, a lot of jobs are still gotten through personal interaction and relationships in, in my company. And we rely on that. Um, assessing people once they're in role is a little easier because you, you see them. You try to uh, utilize these cross-functional groups and see how people react in different, in different environments. We have great technical people who are not great working with others. That's okay. We need great technical people who are not great working with others. You're not going to run the company, um, but you may get paid more than the guy running the company depending on what you invent. So you don't equate the two into, into monetary rewards. Um, so you can be valuable regardless, but if you're interested in kind of career development and broadening your opportunities with a, any organization, the more broad you can create your experiences young, the more opportunities you'd get, I'd say. Did that one surprise you as you advanced in your career? Um, so I, it was a surprise for me how important it was for me to do something other than engineering. And it was a pleasant surprise for me because I wasn't a great engineer. I was not a good engineer, it turns out. And I, I learned early that I wasn't a good engineer and I moved out of it. And that, that allowed me to be more successful than I would have otherwise. But how valuable um, corporate entities saw that diversity of experience was something that was um, surprising to me. I didn't see that in school. I did my uh, internship when I was in UTC with TVA. I worked part-time through the school year and full-time through the summer. Did reports and analysis and stuff like that in a cube downtown. Great people, treated me great, great experience, got me my, my job at, at Monsanto, but I didn't learn that they valued diverse experiences. Um, so that was, that was surprising to me when I entered the workforce. The other thing that surprised me, the, the more I got out, I was a kid who grew up in Chattanooga, didn't travel a lot. First plane ride I took was to my interview in South Carolina with Monsanto. Um, so I, I wasn't very worldly uh, <laughs> at all. Um, the other thing that surprised me is despite how cultures are very different, you know, some people um, seem to be very quiet, reserved, some very hierarchical, by and large, people are the same. They want the same things, they need the same things, they want to do a good job. 
They want to understand what the company wants to accomplish, and they want to contribute to that accomplishment. Um, and if you can get over the, the how piece needing to be the same, you can be successful. If you're somebody who really thinks it's this way, you, you're going to be frustrated when you get out there. So, I mean, I think there are two aspects to that. Um, large companies do provide a wide range of diverse roles. So, again, it, it all comes from perspective, right? I consider Bureau of Carbon a small company at $2 billion. We got 3,000 people and we're spread all around the world, but we're a small company. Providing diverse experiences is tough in our company because not that many people who sit in our factory in Santander, Spain, are interested in leaving the coast of the North Atlantic to go to Brazil or to go to Hungary. So giving them that next opportunity is sometimes challenging um, if they're more restricted geographically. But the bigger the company is, the more those opportunities exist in any one location and around the world. So there's no doubt it provides that. I would say the downside, Phil, from my perspective, is in a small company, you can do more things at one time. So what attracted me to Bureau of Carbon was I could have my hands on everything and see everything in one place. In Monsanto, that didn't exist until you got very high up. And so that opportunity was not, was not there for me w within Monsanto in the, in the time frame I was looking for, or Solutia at the time. Um, so I think there are advantages to both. You can see more different things and have your hands in more cookie jars in one place in small organizations. And in big organizations, you can have more real job assignment and title differences, location differences, um, and interaction differences that will provide you experience, and I think both are good. started in engineering and you ended up pretty much on the business side of things. How did you um, prepare for those each time you changed, moving more towards business? Did you take classes or did you just kind of try to learn on the job or were there resources at the job? Um, it's not as big a leap as you think. First off, um, most, most people have my background who are working in an industry today in this kind of company. So that's, that's kind of, I'm, I'm closer to the norm than the abnorm, um, at least on that side, maybe not on anything else, but on that side. Um, I, I didn't get an MBA. I didn't go back to school. I did educational programs, whether it was uh, two-week executive programs, you know, at Emory or somewhere like that. Um, but I really focused more on cross-functional assignment opportunities. So if there was a chance to work with a business team on an issue, I wanted to participate in that. And that gave me experience to see how somebody does it, whether it was the right way or the wrong way, and to um, adjust my way uh, going through. So in my personal case, it wasn't an education approach. It was kind of take a learning um, perspective to each opportunity. And that's the way I kind of developed. Um, you demonstrate successes along the way and you'll get that next opportunity uh, as a result of that. Um, but, but that's the way I did it. I wouldn't say that's the only way. There are a lot of people who, uh, you can gain a lot from going to business school. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I was married while I was a senior in college here um, and I didn't think I could afford to go to school another year. <laughs> so, so I went to work. What else? Um, how, since you've been COO, how do you think that your, I guess, man management style has changed with as technology continues to change? Is there any way that you think specifically it's really changed? Yeah, so if you look back over my history, a lot of my roles have been what I would describe as restructuring and fix it roles. Um, so I mentioned I was in a company that went through bankruptcy. I had responsibility for restructuring um, our contracts. There's a lot of powers that are afforded a company who enter bankruptcy 
one of which is you can decide what contracts you keep, what contracts you throw out. You have to pay damages on those you throw out. <laughs> um, so I, I spent a lot of time restructuring organizations, downsizing, quite frankly, um, and restructuring contracts and commercial arrangements. I, I was very much a fix-it person for a lot of my career. Um, what I saw as the shortcoming and, and what we're challenged with doing in Bureau of Carbon, particularly when you become big in any one industry, it gets more and more challenging to grow. Some of that's antitrust regulations, some of that's just your customers don't like to see you get bigger and more power, all these other kind of things, but it gets tougher to grow. And what I really saw was innovation is key to our growth. So innovation in terms of understanding what our customers and markets see as creating value and then us either inventing new materials, inventing new services, or partnering, acquiring, interacting with other companies that allow us to provide that value. And innovation ultimately is, is the key to that. So over the last few years, we've gone through a cultural transformation, back to the share the strength tagline, this concept of collaboration. It's really around focusing on the market and understand what the market and customers need and then using innovation to help deliver that. Historically, when you've been in a business for a long time, you're good operators. Operational excellence is core to who we are. So we're not swinging a pendulum from operational excellence. We manage risk very carefully, and that's a huge advantage when it comes to safety, health, and environmental issues. It's a huge advantage when it comes to managing a balance sheet in a company. It's a huge disadvantage when you want to create an innovation culture because we already know it. I've done this for 30 years, I know it. Well, what you thought didn't work before may work now, and what you didn't think of before is probably what we need to be doing. So how do you mesh those two together, maintain that foundation that's based on your experience? And so I see a need to be more of an apostle for change and innovation to allow us to grow, not because I don't want us to be excellent at operations. I'm confident that is core to who we are, our biggest risk is we won't change fast enough to be a leader five or 10 years from now. But it's really more around a desire to grow than it is necessarily just innovation and technology in and of itself. Um, we do very well from a profitability perspective in return. If you've got an investment that has a good return, you wanna put more money into it. To put more money into it, you better have something useful to do with that money. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to do. For Carbon Black specifically? Yes. Um, so when you think about where we're focusing our R&D efforts today, energy storage is clearly one of them. So energy storage is a place that's going to grow at something like 15 to 25 percent per year. You can read studies that say anything else. Um, largely for vehicles. There aren't many markets we participate in that grow at that kind of rate. We, we, we grow at GDP. We have always grown at GDP. We, we do grow at GDP, which is great, by the way. You don't see a lot of great cycles because of that, but, uh, um, but it's not fast. And so energy storage is a place we're putting a lot of effort, and that comes down to how you functionalize the carbon black and how you treat the carbon black to provide certain electrochemical properties in a, in a cell that both increases the uh, storage density of energy and increases the number of cycles you can charge. So from a carbon black perspective, we're focused there. Um, we're focused on new materials that can work synergistically with carbon black in applications that they go into. So you think about, you know, graphene's been the material of the future for 25 years now. It's not very commercially available or used. Um, carbon nanotubes, uh, whether it's single wall carbon nanotubes, multi-wall, things of that nature nanocellulose products, so taking um, you know, tree or biomass material and making nano products, use that jointly with carbon black and it can provide different properties to the applications we already sell to today. In some cases, it can allow you to use less, which lightweights it. So I mentioned a tire has 25% carbon black in it. If you could use 10% carbon black and 0.2% of something else and get the same properties, you take that much weight out of a car, you're gonna make a lot of money. Um, so those are really the areas where we're focused from a research and development standpoint. More near term is really just around product development. So the products we currently make, whether it's materials that uh, we would sell to a paint company like PPG to go into top coat paint for an automobile, how do we make it jetter? We're constantly working with them to tweak products, but that's kind of the incremental 
versus the longer term. We don't spend a lot of time looking at things that, that aren't synergistic with us. So Carbon Black, Bureau of Carbon doesn't have to diversify for diversification's sake. We're part of a diverse conglomerate. So we're not going to spend a lot of time figuring out how to get into maple syrup or some other business we're just not part of today. The group can invest in that. Um, it's got to have synergy, synergies with markets we serve, technologies we have, or the products we make in some way, shape, or form. Brad? In my class that's in here today, um, one of the topics we've been covering most recently is engineering ethics. And so I can cover, you know, the, the tenets of NSPE. I can talk about the rules and guidelines from AICHE. And it looks really, you know, cut and dry, really black and white to them. Um, but I'm always trying to, to stress the real work part of it and how it can really almost be kind of gray. Uh, and I would wonder if you could comment a little bit on what you've encountered. I mean, Monsanto is kind of a case in point about what reputation and ethics of a company can end up doing. So I'd, I'd love to get your perspective. Um, so I, I'm, and my HR guy hates to hear me speak uh, on things like this. I, I hate policies and procedures. Those things you just cited are things I just assume not for me, do the right thing is kind of the rule. If you do the right thing, you're going to be happy with it um, in the end and kind of start with that. But you're exactly right, Brad. It, it, the world's not black and white, and it's easy to say do the right thing. It's not always as easy to see it. Um, so you think of things like the emission uh, monitoring scheme and scandal that Volkswagen went through, and you see the billions of dollars. You think of things uh, like um, safety, health, and environmental concerns that get raised when, you, when BP goes through their issues and you go back and see health and safety audits that highlight these management of change discrepancies. There are no shortcuts. Um, you, never, you never do anything that's going to get somebody hurt. <laughs> and that's at the, at the site floor when you're operating. You see somebody without safety glasses, you mention it. I told Dean Pack his shoe was untied walking down the stairs today. Uh, I can't help it. It's who I am as a, as a guy who manages plants. That's, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a knuckle dragging operator by uh, trade, and, and so I think that way. Um, and, and that carries all the way through to design. And where people get hung up is this view that the organization really needs this. So I'm doing something to help the organization, therefore it must be right. I'm helping UTC with this research, and if I fudge this data just a little bit, I get the grant. If I get the grant, I get this many scholarships, and I, blah, 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 blah. So most of the time, there are people with bad intent out there. Most of the time, it's through good intentions that people go down the wrong path. And I would just encourage you to uh, think through, you work for a company, you work for a university, all these other things, but... They really, really want you to do the right thing. <laughs> it may not feel that way when the pressure is on that warehouse guy to get this shipment out the door. They may think, eh, he doesn't want me to buckle my seatbelt on my fork truck because I'm going to need an email from the COO if I get this important shipment out. He's never going to know if I buckle my seatbelt. How do you make sure what's always first to mind is do the right thing? Always do it right first. Um, do it safe first. Do it right second. Do it fast third. I don't know if that gets at what you're looking for, but. In one of the slides you presented, um, you wanted students graduating from any engineering school to have a sound technical mm -hmm. knowledge and whatnot. With the new Internet of Things around here now, uh, with all the information, abundance of information available at Google, so what thing? From a technical perspective, you mean specifically? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, um, I'll get outside of my um, expertise pretty fast here, and you'll be able to call me on it, so I'm going to be really careful what I say. <laughs> um, foundationally, um, so the basic chemical engineering requirements in my case, uh, you think of things like thermodynamics. Those skills and that knowledge base does help you solve problems in the future, as useless as it may seem when I'm sitting in the library doing those calculations. Um, so the foundational stuff's still important. We were spending some time with uh, Dr. Dacqua, um, and he was talking about, 
you know, how we're trying to move to more uh, research and applications based, I think that's critically important. And the reason is it provides a body of proof that you have those fundamentals. Um, I don't think the, the things like information what's available online and the like really changes what the expectations are of employers. Um, that information is available to you once you join, quite frankly. What we don't have is the expertise to teach them how to do thermodynamics or the time. Um, we don't have the expertise to teach them how to manage kind of basic concepts in ethics. We're dependent on you to have imparted that uh, upon them coming out. Um, so I would say we technically assess people very similarly to the way they did when I joined the workforce. And that may not be the answer you want to hear, but that's the way I would describe the way we operate at Birla Carbon. What we don't do very differently is have much higher expectations around ambitions and appetite for driving change. And we try to look for that kind of interest level differently than we did when I joined the company. A company. Could you clarify on what those expectations were for when you joined Monsanto or for the, whatever is for us in the future? Um, so, you know, there, there are companies out there that will look very carefully at where you graduated. We don't and most don't. And as soon as you're in any company, that falls by the wayside. I've never looked at where anyone's graduated for a job we interviewed for for somebody inside this company. Um, and even those institutions who seem to look at that, um, probably 25% of their employees come from somewhere else anyway. Either my mother's friend knew somebody. I can give you a thousand reasons. So the where you go to school is not very important. UTC is a great institution, accredited. The size of the people in this room would make up roughly, I think, four of the chemical engineering departments when I was at this school. So, I mean, it's amazing to see how different this, this school, and I know you aren't all chemical engineers, but I, I, literally we had seven people when I graduated uh, chemical engineering. Um, so the where you go to school is not very important. The how you do it, it is. So grade point average will make a difference. So, so it's an easy way to look at a resume and make a decision. I can't tell you any differently. I've got a daughter in school and a son that, that teaches high school. Um, you know, but grade, and I've told them, grade point average makes a difference on that first job in terms of getting through the screening process. Experiences, so have you had internships or job experiences? Doesn't have to be in the field you're majoring in or the field of the job you're going to, but having that experience is gonna be very critical. Um, those two things helped get me in the door in an interview at Monsanto. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, then it's a matter of how you interact and, and seem to be a fit within the organization. The other thing I would say is, is you're not gonna be a fit everywhere. That's not bad. It's, probably, it's good you find that out soon, early. If you don't feel it or they don't feel it, you probably don't wanna be there. Yeah, but those two, I mean, those basic things are important for getting through the, the screening process from my perspective. I don't know, you guys have been putting students into the world for a long time. Do you disagree or have you, have you seen something different with kids who get great jobs versus kids who don't? I agree. <laughs> and I think that you know, basically uh, a good toolbox of skills is important, but that's not enough. It, let me ask you, we used to talk about you could take a technical path or a management path. My thinking is now that they're not that separate. I don't know what you, what do you think about that in terms of? Yeah, so um, I, I would agree. So for instance, in Monsanto, we had fellows. So you come in as a chemical engineer, you work your way through process engineering, you, you may get a PhD or have a PhD, you eventually become a, a technical expert, and you eventually become a fellow, and those are very high level individuals in the organization. Um, the other option I had would have been to be a manager, and those two diverged very early. I mean, if I, if I decided to go down one path very early, I was on that path. Um, today, in most companies, we're not as good as we used to be about developing technical career paths for fellows and experts, but we're a lot more flexible about utilizing someone's skills and experiences to move across those um, arenas 
where we see them providing opportunity, create value. A, uh, we hired a PhD uh, guy out of Georgia Tech, material scientist, four years ago now, five years ago now. Um, he spent his time working on rubber technology. Um, right now, he is uh, driving our uh, efforts into energy storage. Really smart guy. I see him as a regional president to lead a business. He's not done anything to lead a business yet. I took him to South America when we rolled out the Purpose Project in that region. I physically visited every site over the course of four weeks, and he went meet with me to one region. Doesn't mean he wants to be a business leader, and he may never choose to, but he can do both, and the expectation is people will. So I'd agree with you, Dr. McMahon. I don't think, we certainly don't set up tracks that, that compartmentalize early, and that's why that diverse set of experiences early, I think, is important. When you say diverse experience, sometimes I, I don't know if it's the same now, but for example, I was in the uh, packaging industry, paper industry. Mm -hmm. If you have just experience in that industry, sometimes it's hard to, to move because you can only go to companies and there, and there's this problem about confidentiality and everything. Yeah. I agree. So I, I don't value individual experience very highly. Now, I'm not saying I'm the only one. There are people in my company who do. So we've got lots of folks who think when we're hiring a technical leader or a manufacturing leader for a carbon black plant is they have to come from somebody who's making carbon black. Um, but what you'll find more and more of is a recognition. If you've been around a few times, the problems are largely the same. The jargon's different, and they like to confuse you with the jargon. I, I, people love that. Um, but if somebody's explaining something in a way that it sounds complicated, it either means they don't know the answer or they don't know what the hell they're talking about. I mean, things are simple if you understand what you're doing. If it doesn't sound simple, I would, I would look under the covers. Um, so I think that's changing some. And again, there aren't enough jobs in any one industry. And I think people are valuing how technologies work together. Um, so, you know, if you started with Champion, you're not going to wind up either staying at Champion or International Paper or whoever the successor is of that company forever anymore. But the unit operations in that managing the liquor side are not that different than how we generate energy from our byproduct gas stream and how integrated that is into a paper factory, right, versus how integrated that is into a carbon black plant. So I don't think you're going to see um, most companies look too hard for very specific experience. We weren't able to get the uh, lady who we tried to hire to lead one of our technology um, pillars, uh, but she spent her time in uh, bio uh, materials and, and nano cellulose type products, and we wanted her to lead our specialty carbon black technology organization. She doesn't know a lot about tech carbon black at all, but she knows how to work with customers. She knows how to drive innovation projects. She knows how to recruit smart people. So I, I don't think the specific industry experience anymore is as important. But as soon as I say that, um, you talk about things like energy storage, and you look at um, these uh, people who are the leading innovators in, in energy. There's a company right down the street here who uh, has a really smart guy who um, studied with somebody who's the technical advisor to Tesla, and that guy is kind of the spawn. It's like these coaching trees in basketball. You know, that guy's the spawn of all these technical experts. He's hiring UTC grads to work in his factory today. But when we go looking for somebody who knows batteries, we do go looking for one of those people. So companies still look for technical experts, but they're for very narrow, specific requirements from our perspective. Well, it's a lot of pressure. I was doing good generating questions. You told me I might struggle to get them, so I was real proud of myself up until now. Now you, now you kind of put the pressure on the group. You talked a lot about collaboration <laughs> as being like one of the keys to innovation. I was wondering what, I guess, factors help promote like a healthy relationship between two companies to like help innovate. Um, so I think openness and transparency is important. So we're proud of the technology we've developed, but we also don't think we're the smartest in the room on anything, even making carbon black. Um, and, and I think that initial interaction where you either build trust or you destroy it winds up being the key 
Um, we had a company that we're looking to work with on a sustainability type program. They're a small startup type company, but uh, 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 they have high ambitions. And their comment to us was, well, we really like working with you guys and we'd like to make something happen because you treat us like equals. Um, I think creating that trust up front winds up being the critical thing when you're working, whether it's with an academic partner, a customer. Um, there are certain things you can't divulge, and that's always the case. Um, but draw those lines beforehand or up front, and then be open and transparent in your interaction. And the reality is you can be good friends and not be partners. You can be partners and not agree on everything. If you agree on everything, you pick the wrong partner because they're not helping you. <laughs> Thank you all. This is terrific. I know. Let's give John a big round of applause.